impact. Well, this will be our last talk for the session before afternoon tea. So I'd like to introduce Sasha Wilmer, who's going to be presenting with collaborators Rachel Nordlinger, Gabriela Garrido Rodriguez, and also Evan Kidd, speaking about word order flexibility in Pitten Jada across genres and generations. Um, so I'm here uh, representing the line for this lot in generous places, although Evan may have woken up early for joining so I'm not sure. Um, they're all very sad that they could make it, but on behalf of all of us, just want to express our wish uh, a create appreciation and admiration for you, Jane. Um, and Rachel said, um, I feel very privileged to have had my career in her warm, glowing shadow. And here she's put a little car eyes emoji. Um, <laughs> she's, uh, Jane has also been instrumental through the success of Kobo, and it's been a special joy to work closely with her on over the last eight years. Um, and Evan says, Jane is simply the most lovely and supportive colleague anyone could ask for. Um, so from all of us, we wish you the very best for retirement and hope to see you after me. Um, so this um, study is um, obviously the topic that um, is influenced by some of Jane's um, early work. So Australian languages are, of course, well known for having very flexible word order. So as Jane puts it in Walbury, the burden of representing the relations between predicates and arguments is borne by the morphology rather than the syntax. So the syntax um, allows for a sentence such as this to have five other possible orders, which are all equally grammatical, and the choice of orders um, said to be pragmatically driven in, in previous studies of uh, free word order in, or flexible word order in Australian languages. So our study uh, is based on two types of data. One is an experimental picture description task, and the other is more spontaneous speech. Um, so picture data is um, of course, a Western Desert language spoken in Central Australia. Um, it has its dependent marking from an OBD case system, and it's also very vibrant and um, still learned by children as a first language. The fieldwork for this project was carried out in Pukaja, just in green here, um, just below the anti border in the AP line in South Australia. Um, so, first, I'll just give a brief overview of what people have said previously about um, word order in Pitten Data. And I'll explain our two types of data. Um, and our first question is uh, just broadly what determines the choice of different word orders. And then um, we'll look at, is there any change towards uh, more English-like word order patterns among the other speakers? So um, previously, people have said that there is a basic uh, subject object verb word order in Pitten Data, and this is sort of pragmatically neutral. Um, SVO um, occurs when the object might be an afterthought following the clause after the verb, or if it's a verb prominent construction where it's the um, verb itself that's the more important information. OSV um, is said to occur when the object is topicalized, and OBS is used when the Subject is an afterthought, also usually following the clause after the verb. Um, and I, I do sort of think that these generally hold in Pitta. Um, so we got the clause initial um, position being quite prominent, um, as Jane has worked on before, and this post verbal arguments being often afterthoughts. Um, ellipsis is also extremely frequent, frequent um, and both points out that. Uh, particularly subjects tend to be prohibited uh, where the um, reference is clear from context. Um, then Annie Lenoir observed in um, working in Arionga in the 1990s that um, teenage speakers supposedly, supposedly have a basic order of SVO, so more like English rather than SOB. And you can see this comparison between um, what Heather Bow found and this Lenoir, although it was based on an extremely limited amount of data, so it's something that really um, needs to be looked into a bit more. Um, so our experimental data comes from a picture description task. So um, we had 49 participants, mix of men and women uh, with a wide range of ages in Pukaja. Uh, they were shown 48 test pictures of two participant events, 
And in these pictures, humanness and thematic role were fully crossed. So we had 12 humans acting on non humans and so on, with all the different combinations. And these pictures were all completely independent of each other and they were interspersed with field pictures. Um, and you can read more about the methodology in this random paper that just came out, came out recently in language by um, I call this to run the same experiment in the fire. So in the end, this um, turns up with the data set of uh, 1,865 um, transitive main causes. And then to, to that, we're adding the spontaneous data. So this is um, a subset of what I've um, recorded from my PhD project. And this is 23 speakers, um, all women, again, with a wide age range. And this is uh, mostly narratives, some sort of um, people telling their own stories, often like multiple people um, telling their own stories together, and a lot of elicited narratives from books or videos, such as um, these girls taking turns um, describing Hindu episodes here, and a, a few um, ones of the uh, Scopic family called the Chelsea as well. Um, so this um, ended up with 1,110 transitive main causes. Um, and we've coded all of these four things like word order, humanness, um, speaker attributes, and so on. And because there was a lot of um, anthropomorphized animals like Pingu here, I coded these as human because they're sort of treated like humans, like speakers. Um, and I've also excluded um, sentences with pronominal clitics. Um, so these are optional if you don't they occur after the first constituent. Um, so I've sort of set that aside now. Okay, so just to summarize the orders that we found, um, in the experimental data, we found all possible orders. Um, and we found all possible orders, except for verb, object, subject in the spontaneous data. And there was only one actual instance of that experimental data, so it's too small to see them, but there was one, so we can't say we got them all. Um, as you can see with these orange bars here, ellipsis was much more frequent in the spontaneous data, which is um, not surprising. Um, and we can also see that um, SOV was the most frequent order in the experimental data, it was about half of responses. Um, whereas in the spontaneous data, um, these uh, OB, SV, and B um, orders were most frequent, but where both arguments were expressed, the most common was SOB. Um, and so SOB in both types of data was about twice as frequent as SV. Um, so, what drives choices of different word orders? Um, Generally, the, the pragmatic factors that people talk about, I do think, hold, but the experimental data allows us to look at um, what orders people choose outside of any discourse context. So um, here I've shown the orders according to the humanness or non-humanness of the subject and object. And I could sort of, um, we sort of distilled like four general principles that guide a lot of this variation. So the first of that is, um, Asian before patient, so almost three quarters of the sentences had the agent before the patient. So these examples um, just the basic SOV and SVO. On the other hand, um, only 9% of sentences had the patient or the agent, so these are one and the other. Um, and so that brings up the question of um, why would you have the patient before the agent? In, um, these sentences. So our second principle, which is sometimes conflicting with the first one, is human before non-human. So looking at object, subject, verb sentences, about half the time, it was a human patient that appeared um, before the non-human agent. So in this one, the birds get two boys, those boys come first. Um, so that's OSV, but looking at the other one of OVS, there's a different pattern. So almost half of those actually had the non-human patient first and uh, the human agent at the end. And looking at these, this, these were often uh, these afterthought constructions where it seems like the speaker starts with 
an OV sentence and then they have a pause and then they have a subject. So this is consistent with what um, others have said about OVS sentences. The third principle and probably the strongest one is um, no initial verbs. So there's um, only 49 um, uh, sentences which we've coded as verb initial and most of these were verb only. So really, really rare to get a verb followed by some argument. Is it going to switch on? And all of these actually only 22 are in fact truly verb initial because um, there were often instruments before the verb. So in this sentence, it's a picture of um, a nurse um, giving a child an injection and it's the instrument that comes first. But because we're only looking at subjects and objects, that wasn't um, included in either. So really, really, um, they hate having verbs first. Um, our fourth one is that humans can be elided. So about 16% of human reference in the experimental data were elided. And this is where there's absolutely no discourse context. So it's not like um, it's the topic of the discourse or anything like that. And that's compared to 2.8% of non humans. Um, and in these um, orders, S, V, O, V, and B, the vast majority of the time it's, it's the human arguments which are being dropped. Um, on the other hand, subjects and objects are elided at a similar rate. So um, at least in the experimental data, humanness seems to be the factor determining the process. Um, so to summarize this so far, we can see that um, humanness and grammatical function have an effect on word order choices separate from the um, uh, discourse pragmatic factors and S and from those four principles, SOV um, and SEO turn out to be the most frequent, and they also predict that VOS is the least preferred word. Um, looking at the spontaneous data, um, the first main difference is that the humanness is um, not balanced. So um, the most typical sentence is a human subject and not human object. Um, and then, of course, there's much fewer non-human subjects. Um, so this is, again, looking at um, human versus non-human subjects and the humanness of objects. And in this least prototypical combination, where there's a non-human subject acting on a human object, um, this shows quite a different pattern to the other combinations. So those human objects tend to get planted. So that's the green and yellow ones that are and um, this could be an effect of um, object like topicalizing human objects. Um, but it also seems to be the case that I suspect humanness itself does play a role in discourse. So um, this OBS sentence, our language keeps us happy. Um, and I forgot to format that one nicely. Um, the speakers put the human object first, um, even though. She's talking about the importance of her language, saying our language keeps us strong, our language keeps us happy. Um, so keep keeping happy, that's the actual main new information. Um, and the subject is um, our language. Um, and it's not an afterthought here, but she puts the human object first. So it's a mix of a sort of um, humanist plus the pragmatic. Um, and looking at ellipsis, ellipsis, as I already mentioned, humans um, uh, play a big role in whether arguments are dropped in the experimental data. And we see a different pattern in spontaneous data. So apart from ellipsis being much more frequent, we see that, um, again, humans are more likely to be elided, but it's a much weaker effect than in the experimental data. And subjects are more likely to be elided, and this is a very strong effect compared to the experimental data. So I think this is um, actually more about information structure. Um, so particularly human subjects are dropped in this is because they're often topics, um, so they're often given a different context or subjects of multiple subsequent clauses. Okay, so 
The second question we had, um, is there any generational change in word order patterns more towards an English-like patterns due to language contact? Um, and these sorts of changes have been found in language contact situations um, elsewhere in Australia, both in terms of um, changes to like the fundamental uh, structure of the language in how grammatical relations are established. There's nothing like that going on in the case marking system is basically unchanged. Um, but as I mentioned, um, Lengua found this shift to SVO as the basic word order. Um, and the other difference between English and um, many Australian languages is um, also about being very rigid or, or flexible. So English is more rigid, um, Pindar is more flexible. So we're looking at these two things separately. Um, Oh yeah, so first, um, in terms of flexibility, which we measure with entropy, so this, um, I've plotted each individual participant in the experiment according to their age on the x-axis and their variability as measured by um, entropy on the y-axis. So the higher their entropy, um, the more variable their production is. If they have an entropy of zero, um, it means they only produce one order. Um, and here I've only included the experimental data because um, each speaker had an equal number of contributions, so it's actually comparable. And I've also um, color coded it according to gender because you see this quite interesting effect. So this um, sort of teal colored line shows um, the men who participated in the experiment, and there's no significant correlation between uh, variability and age. On the other hand, these women, uh, the women have a really strong negative correlation between entropy and age. So the older women are much more rigid in their um, distributions, whereas the younger women have much more variable distributions um, and are behaving more like the men. So this is really not what we would expect um, if there's you know, some shift to more English like rigidity. And um, we suspect this is because a lot of those women who participated happen to be um, people who've worked as language teachers or translators or interpreters for many years. So they have a very um, different idea of what correct hidden data is and a sort of commitment to uphold that. And so perhaps they had a different approach to this experimental task. And because we have these two types of data recorded in the same community, we can compare some individuals across both genres. So there were four participants in both data sets, three older ones and uh, one younger woman. So these older ones, you can see this, the yellow section, that's all SOV. So they're really relying on SOV in the experimental data. In the um, spontaneous data, the same women just have much more variable orders, not just due to ellipsis, but more variable overall. Um, whereas you can see this um, younger we woman behaves very similar. There's Sasha, she's. Oh, she's, she's just that, um, it was about their approach to the experimental task and variability actually is stable across generations. It's not a, it's not a... Um, finally, the question of Josh, basic the word order. Uh, looking at the experimental data, it, it might look like there's a, a very clear trend towards SVO. So younger people are using SOV, SOV than SVO at similar rates, um, whereas older people are using much more SOV. But again, looking at the spontaneous data, um, speakers of all ages are actually using them at um, pretty comparable rates. So I actually don't think there's any shift going on to SOV, SVO as a basic word order, at least in, in Fukuja. Um, so to conclude, um, as well as all the pragmatic factors that people have um, written about before, We've also identified these four principles of agent before patient, human before non-human, no verb initial, and humans can be elided. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any change towards English-like patterns, either in variability or basic word order. And um, I hope we've also demonstrated the usefulness of using this type of experimental data because firstly, you can get much more speakers um, very quickly. Um, and you have a, a more balanced data set in terms of humanness, so it would take a huge amount of data to get that many 
non-human subjects, for example, and allows us to separate um, semantic and syntactic factors from discourse, which are um, so tangled up in the information structure in more naturalistic speech. Uh, and then we can use the comparison to um, help guide our interpretation of, of what is done to us. Um, thanks to all speakers and thanks for listening. Um, and that's our references.